was 2.88. In presence of sodium acetate, the pH rises. We proved our point. There is nothing but something that uh, resists a pH change. So buffers resist resist pH change pH change. So you might ask, you might ask, you might wonder, how is it that they are going to do that? First off, um, buffers are important first and foremost, and I'm going to get into how they do that. But why are buffers important? They are tremendously important, especially in biology, because all physiological processes they occur usually, usually within a narrow pH range. For example, uh, for us. Our best performance is seen when the pH is between 7.24 to 7.40. That's a pretty narrow range. It's only 0.16 uh, pH unit. And so it's, 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 it's important to maintain that pH. Any pH lower than that or any pH higher than that can lead to a condition called as acidosis or acidosis or alkalinosis which essentially refers to greater amount of hydronium ion or greater amount of hydroxide uh, that means the buffer in our, in our case blood being the buffer has gotten disturbed somehow and so sometimes uh, a drastic change in the pH uh, could be even fatal. So you you can you can have symptoms like dizziness and shortness of breath, um, unconsciousness, and in the worst scenario, it can even be fatal. Um, and so maintaining that buffer for the proper functioning of the ecological system is of utmost importance. It is really important. Um, so. To give you a flavor, um, uh, let's consider the antifreeze ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol, the structure of that is this compound. And you can perhaps envision that this would be very soluble in water because it has the capacity to form hydrogen bonds uh, at the OH. Now, this is something, if, if you are wondering, we have talked about this, though, previously um, as to where we use this this is used in your car radiator in the coolant and uh, it's used as an antifreeze in the cars as an aqueous solution uh, of ethylene glycol and so it, it, it does have a somewhat sweet taste and uh, so it can attract you know small pets or even young children um, who, who could be vulnerable to this toxic compound um, now, the first stage of this glycol poisoning um, resembles like a state of drunkenness. And um, later on, if left untreated, essentially this could uh, lead to uh, more problems. Now, how does ethylene glycol metabolize? Uh, in liver, ethylene glycol gets oxidized into glyconic acid. So one of these... Uh, OHs gets converted into COOH and it enters the bloodstream. Realize this is a carboxylic acid, so this is acidic, and this is going to drop the pH of the blood if the blood were not um, a buffer. So, depending on the amount of the glycolic acid that you have. Realize that uh, blood itself uh, is under a very tight, uh, while ecologically, physiologically, most of our cells are between 7.24 to 7.40. Blood is between 7.36 to 7.42. So it's tighter. <coughs> and many proteins essentially require this uh, narrow pH range for their, for their proper functioning. Um, and... Uh, if if this glyco glycolic acid enters the bloodstream, uh, essentially uh, there can be a problem because if um, the concentration of glycolic acid is too much, then the buffer may not be able to um, resist that pH change. Realize that you have H2CO3 carbonic acid, which 
and presence of base would give you water and bicarbonate and this bicarbonate is um, going to neutralize the protons provided by the glycolic acid the H plus to give you H2CO3 back so in this way the carbonic acid bicarbonate uh, bicarbonate buffering system keeps the pH blood uh, or pH of the blood uh, constant now if um, the concentration like I was saying if that concentration of glycolic acid becomes too much then the blood pH is going to drop dangerously low and that kind of situation would be called as acidosis and this is going to affect the ability of hemoglobin for instance to be able to carry oxygen so just to give you a flavor uh, hemoglobin hemoglobin uh, um, in the protonated form combines picks up the oxygen and uh, carries oxygen while it delivers the proton off. Now we are saying that glycolic acid is present in the system. That means we are able to pump in um, protons into the system. And so according to the Lee Chatelier principle, hopefully you can see that a backward reaction will be more pronounced. That means the ability of hemoglobin to pick up oxygen is going to be diminished. And so if that is the situation, then your then your pet or the child um, would be hyper uh, ventilating in an effort to overcome this acidic um, blood's lowered oxygen carrying capacity and if left untreated this can the results of the situation could be really bad um, and so uh, it, yeah to the extent that it could be fatal um, one treatment for ethylene glycol poisoning is the administration of ethyl alcohol. Um, ethyl alcohol is essentially your wine, what is present in any alcoholic beverage uh, for that matter. The two molecules are similar. The only difference between the two is that one contains only one single OH, the other contains two, uh, two uh, hydroxyl uh, groups. But the way the two are metabolized is pretty different. Um, so essentially uh, the liver enzyme is going to, P450 is going to work on ethanol as well, um, but uh, it's going to generate uh, either, it's going to uh, go through the body unmetabolized um, or it's going to generate acetic acid, which by the way is also generated naturally in our system. So it's not going to be, it's going to be excreted um, through the urine and and uh, uh, we are not going to see, um, you know, these kind of effects uh, that we see for the case of the glycolic acid generated from ethylene glycol. So again, uh, I gave you the entire story about buffers, gave you an instance of that to make you understand that buffers, the primary reason for that is, um, for the existence of buffers in nature is to resist uh, pH change um, because essentially nature would want to protect itself uh, as much as it, as it can. Um, now, you might ask what does the buffer um, contain and how does the buffering action take place and like I said earlier uh, a buffer contains a weak acid and its conjugate base or it could contain a weak base and its conjugate acid. So either it will contain a weak acid with its conjugate base or it would contain a weak base with the conjugate acid. Both of those can act as buffers. For example, in the uh, previous uh, slide, I gave you a situation where I had carbonic acid, H2CO3, and I removed the proton and gave you bicarbonate. So that's one buffer, right? Um, so that's the weak acid. That's the conjugate base associated with it. Uh, you could have uh, ammonia, 
with ammonium where ammonia is your weak base and ammonium is your conjugate acid so a weak acid by itself even though it partially ionizes to form some of the conjugate base does not contain sufficient base to behave itself like a buffer similarly a weak base by itself even though it partially ionizes water uh, to form some of the conjugate acid doesn't contain sufficient amount um, of acid to behave like a buffer that means a buffer should contain significant amount of both a weak acid as well as a conjugate base but i just said again just to give you a flavor because we have seen both of those um both of those reactions previously let's say you have um you let's say you have hf okay when you put hf in water you're going to get a little bit of hydronium ion and you're going to get f minus but it's not like a hundred percent dissociation because it's a weak acid right so my hf f minus system doesn't necessarily have like a boatload amount of f minus um, likewise if you consider the backward reaction or the fact that fluorides generate um, a slightly alkaline uh, um, solution so if you put that in water it's going to rip off the proton and will give you HF and um, OH negative back right so F minus is giving you HF but it's not enough it's not sufficient so uh, based on those two reactions that we have seen in the past realize that HF on its own cannot behave like a like a uh, buffer because it doesn't have significant amount of F minus ion. It's not a complete ionization. That's right. And the other is that F minus on its own, so sodium fluoride on its own, for instance, is not going to generate uh, enough amount of HF for that matter. And so for that reason, neither the conjugate base by itself nor the weak acid by itself can behave as buffers. But the two together, the two together um, are uh, included uh, to form a buffer. So a buffer must contain significant amounts, significant amounts of uh, the weak acid and the conjugate base are desired. So concentration is a big thing. Okay. All right. Now, suppose you add like a strong base such as sodium hydroxide, okay, that's a strong base which undergoes complete ionization and I put it in acetic acid. So I have acetic acid CH3COOH and I have sodium hydroxide and I put, I put uh, the two together. You, can, you will say that acetic acid will neutralize the base so it will generate uh, CH3, COO, and A, and H2O will be will be generated as the byproduct. So one can say that as long as the amount of the added sodium hydroxide is less than the amount of acetic acid in terms of moles, then um, you know uh, the buffer is going to be able to neutralize that. So uh, since we know that acetic acid is going to neutralize the acid. Uh, or I'm sorry, the alkaline part, if this acetic acid is a part of a buffer, so let's say now it's part of a buffer, CH3COOH, and you add the sodium acetate, they are together. Um, if you add a little bit of sodium hydroxide, as long as the moles of sodium hydroxide are less than the moles of uh, acetic acid, Essentially, that acetic acid should be able to neutralize the added sodium hydroxide. And likewise, if you add um, HCl to the system, so suppose you added HCl to the system, as long as the moles are going to be less than the moles of the base, which in this case is going to be sodium acetate, because that sodium acetate will react with HCl to give you acetic acid and and cl negative so with acetate it's, you're going to get acetic acid 
and Cl negative. So if it was sodium acetate, that will become NaCl in that case. Uh, so realize that as long as the number of moles that are being added are less than the moles or the concentration of the acid part and the base part of the buffer, we would be able to resist pH change. That means whatever change occurs, it's going to be minimal. That's why we say the resistance in the pH uh, will occur. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, you just add too much of the acid or the base, then of course the bu buffer won't be able to withstand that. And hence, you know, in, in that case, uh, uh, there'll be a problem anyways. So just to again summarize, um, buffers will resist pH change. Buffers contain significant amounts of both a weak acid and the conjugate base. And the weak acid neutralizes uh, the added base while the conjugate base neutralizes the added acid. So let's take a look how we can generate uh, a buffer. And when the two are mixed, essentially the starting point is, you know, uh, how does that change the, the pH of the solution anyway? So let's take a look at that first. So the solution that is a weak acid and the conjugate base mixture and which resists a drastic pH change is what is called as buffer. Small amounts of hydroxide are going to resist, uh, they're going to increase the pH by a little bit, tad bit, but not by much. So let's say the buffer was like 4.78, it might become like 4.80 or 4.81, but it's not going to become 6. All right, and this is because the acid component of the buffer would be able to neutralize the OH for the reasons I explained previously. Um, uh, likewise, realize that if you would add hydronium ion source, so if you add some kind of an acid, it's going to, again, decrease the pH, but not by much because the conjugate base component of the buffer is going to neutralize the added hydronium ion. So that is the reason why you need to have a significant amount of acid and a significant amount of the conjugate base in that buffer solution that concentration is really really so just to give you a flavor some examples acetic acid and acetate hf with f negative ammonium ammonia we talked about this in class as well realize we would not be able to get a buffer of hbr br negative or maybe hcl cl negative these are not buffers no and if you can think of a suitable reason, that reason is that uh, HBr is going to completely dissociate and give you 100% proton and 100% Br negative, the conjugate base. Uh, it's too much. There is no acid component uh, left there. All it contains is the conjugate base. So uh, that is the reason why you're not going to be able to use a strong acid uh, for the buffer. It has to be a weak, bas weak base or weak acid uh, and its conjugate version um, and like we did, we've already discussed I gave you the example as well buffers are very important in biological system for proper protein functioning um, because proteins hopefully you know this from a biology class proteins ultimately uh, depend on their structure the way they fold uh, for their functioning as well and if a protein misfolds or let's say a particular nitrogen atom undergoes a protonation let's say because of the presence of the as uh, the added acid um, a protein may not be able to fold the way it's supposed to so it might lose its shape and if it loses its shape it probably will also lose its function so the shape is vital for the functioning of uh, of a protein now, um, I'm going to go over, uh, you know, more math problems. I'm going to give you the logical way, and I'm also going to give you the easier way. We are going to take a look at both of those and go with that. Um, I'm going to work on one, and I expect you to work on the other, following the steps so that both of us know how to go about it. All right, the question is addition of hydroxide to a buffer. So if what happens if we add 0 0.01 moles of solid NaOH to one liter of the buffer. So the buffer is already there and we have added 
a little bit off the base okay so how do we go about it that's what we are going to discuss next now what I want you to do is I want you to think about what kind of equilibriums do we have in this buffer so we have sodium acetate I said sodium acetate which was put in water that means it gives you so acetate and sodium and we had taken 0.1 that means acetate is present up to 0.1 molar solution uh, we took acetic acid so that's my main ionization acetic acid plus H2O giving you hydronium and acetate and uh, uh, essentially acetic acid concentration is 0.1 initial concentration um, and of course we are going to use uh, the remainder from what's going on in that solution we are saying that we have added a tad bit we have added a little bit of sodium um, hydroxide solid sodium hydroxide to this buffer the amount that we added was 0 0.01 what does sodium hydroxide do in AOH it completely ionizes it will provide you OH negative and Na plus how much OH negative would it provide 0 0.01 and that OH negative is going to basically react with the acetic acid component of uh, the buffer and uh, so hopefully you can see a third reaction is going to take place that the acetic acid because realize my buffer is CH3COOH and CH3COO minus so what's going to happen is that this added OH negative is going to uh, react with the acid part not the conjugate base but the acid part of the buffer so CH3 COOH is going to react with the OH negative and give you what it will give you water and acetate one might ask how much of acetic acid would react well realize the stoichiometry is one to one that means if I have 0 0.0 zero one moles of the hydroxide zero point zero one moles of acetic acid would have reacted and zero point zero one moles of acetate would have gotten generated what does that mean that means that if you have to set up your eyes your you began with 0.1 molar solution of acetic acid but part of it has reacted so you must subtract that from your initial concentration hydronium of course is still zero um, acetate you have 0.1 from sodium acetate but you have also formed a tad bit from this reaction in red so you must add that 0.01 to this acetate of course the change is going to be the same way and so your overall reaction is going to be 0 0.09 minus x at equilibrium x for the case of hydronium and 0 0.11 plus x for the case of acetate and now if you use these numbers to plug in for your ka your ka will start looking like hydronium which is x times acetate which is 0.11 plus x divided by 0 0.09 minus x again you ask yourself if you can use the approximation or not so the concentration of acetic acid is 0.1 the ka value is 1.7 or 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth which is way more than a hundred the approximation is valid and so uh, you can neglect the value of x and you can rewrite this as 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth is equal to x times 0 0.11 divided by 0 0.09 and now we are going to solve as we solve x will come out to be 1.47 
times 10 to the power of negative fifth molar and x is nothing but the hydronium ion concentration so if you take the negative log of this number 1.47 times 10 to the negative fifth that's going to give you a value of 4.83 recall your uh, pH of the buffer was 4.78 pH of the buffer was 4.78 and it only rose up to 4.83 uh, in spite of adding the 0 0.01 uh, moles of the base. I want to just give you a scenario just to kind of, you know, uh, make you realize uh, what this resistance to pH is. Right now we are saying the change in the pH, it has increased, yes, because you added buffer, but the increase is very, very little. It's only 0 0.05 units. That's nothing. Compare this to a situation what would have happened if you would have 0 0.01 moles of sodium hydroxide to distilled water distilled water you know distilled water the ph of neutral water is 7 if you would have added if you would have added 0 0.01 moles of NaOH, that means the concentration, and we'll, we'll keep it one liter, um, the concentration would have been uh, 0 0.01 molar. <coughs> so the pOH, because it's a complete dissociation, um, the pOH is going to be negative log of 10 to the power of minus 2, which would have been 2, or pH would have been 14 minus 2, which is 12. That means you would have gone from pH 7 to pH 12, a difference of 5 units. And realize that if this is on the negative logarithmic scale, that means the concentration of the hydronium is changing by a hundred thousand folds. Because as you can perhaps recall from chapter 15, that with every unit change in pH, uh, that basically means that the hydronium ion changes by one unit. So that's pretty, pretty remarkable. That's pretty significant. So realize that a buffer did not allow a change more than 0 0.05 units whereas water doubly distilled water uh, or deionized water that will jump from 7 to 12 because of the absence of buffer in that scenario all right the question here is that we have added hydronium ion to a buffer it's exactly the same situation i want you to think about what all has happened and just to get you started i would give you the equations but i really want you to work on the math of this i have worked the base function for you i want you to work on the acid function and obviously there is a reason i want you to work on um, how to go about the ice problem specifically uh, for this so realize again we have uh, two things in our buffer we have acetic acid which with water is going to give you hydronium plus acetate that's my main uh, ionization and um, I have I have in my solution I have sodium acetate CH3COO minus Na plus so if I use 0.1 that is going to give me um, 0.1 moles of sodium and 0.1 of the acetate and to that I'm going to now add hydronium so what would happen if I add hydronium or H plus um, that H plus now is going to react with acetate so hydronium plus CH3COO negative is going to give you CH3COOH and water what does that tell you that tells you that um, the acetate because hydro amount of hydronium I added is only 0 0.01 and that's going to completely combine it's going to get used up by the acid uh, acetate which is why it doesn't feature in your initial concentration for the ice 
uh, it's going to completely use up and how much will be used up 0 0.01 will be used up to generate 0 0.01 of acetic acid so now all you got to do is set up your ice you have to think about how much acetic acid is present you were given 0 0.1 to begin with but have you generated more acetic acid in the process aha you will add 0 0.01 in this case acetate you had 0 0.1 in the system and since some of it got used up you're going to subtract that and of course the rest of it remains exactly the same so work on the math for that and figure out what the pH of that solution would be. You should see a slight decrease in this case. Uh, so starting from 4.78 was the pH of our buffer. You will see a slight decrease. It might drop to like 4.70, 4.69 in that range uh, roughly. 